Amen. Tell your neighbor, Amen. All right, who's ready for the last session? Let's do this. So, so this last session, I just basically want to tell you or to share with you what I sense God has for us next year. Is that okay? So just give you a bit of a sneak peek. It's not the detail, it's just the big picture, some of the things I'm sensing God saying for us next year. And it's just for you to take so you can begin to pray for them. So the rest of this year as you pray, I want you to put these things in prayer. So I'm going to share with you uh, quick about them. I'm going to share one major announcement as well, something that God just put in our spirits, something very fresh that we're trusting God will happen uh, along some of the things we've been talking about. Uh, so just going to share that with you, be the first to hear about that. And then we're going to take communion, and I'm going to explain what that will mean for us. But uh, the text I want to talk from, or just refer to as I start, is 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 to 10. It's one of my favorite scriptures, and it's... Uh, it is a scripture that I believe that every single one of us needs to hang on to and to believe. Because I believe that this scripture just begins to talk about the limits of our imagination. It, when it comes to how God can move, it talks about the limits of our imagination. Often we box God. We kind of think that God works the way we work. So sometimes we pray for things without even understanding that God has a much bigger plan. And I, f- I found from my wife, she's very good at this. Uh, by the way, I'll often quote Pastor Caro. She's really shaped my life a lot. I'm so glad to be married to this woman. She's incredible. I really thank God for her. Um, and and she, she is, um, she is uh, she's a very prayerful woman, by the way. And I think God has given her a gift of wisdom. Uh, wisdom is actually a spiritual gift. And she definitely has a gift of wisdom. So one of the things she taught me is when, when, um, when you want to pray for something that's bothering you, rather than praying God take away this issue, or God, give me this, your first prayer should always be, God, show me how to pray about this. Because the Bible says the Holy Spirit is the one who intercedes for us. So he already knows what you should be praying for. So your first prayer, spend some time first asking God, show me how to pray, and then God shows you, and then you pray. As God puts it in your spirit, then pray. Uh, Don't automatically assume the thing you're praying is the thing you should be praying. So this verse says, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9 and 10, it says, however, as it is written, what no eye has seen, What no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love Him, these are the things God has revealed to us by His Spirit. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, back to verse 9, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things that God has for you and has for your future, your eye has not seen. Often we base our knowledge on what we have seen. We extrapolate from what we've seen God doing in other families, God has doing in other people. So we pray for those things. Bless me like you bless so and so. The Bible says, eye has not seen. Ear has not heard. The things that God has for you, you've not even heard about. I ha- mind has not conceived. When Caro and I began to pray that God would bless us and give us a ministry and help us to impact our generation, our wildest plans did not conceive our current reality. They didn't. When we began to pray about our finances several years ago, and we, make, we made a five-year plan, and we submitted it to the Lord, like, it was so foolish, I even keep it in my journal, to prove this verse to me. Like, I used the greatest imagination I had. I was like, Lord, in this time, I want to have this. I can see you blessing us with this. We can work hard, and we can get this and this. And I'm a sort, by the way. She tells you, I, by the way, me, I extrapolate. I know how to, I had like had thought through those things. And I'd looked at what we had, how we could position it, how we could get that. And I can tell you that it is, re- I keep that paper to laugh. Because what God did for us in the last five years financially makes that paper ridiculous. It's like the scribblings of a preschooler. No eye has seen. No ear has heard. No mind has conceived the things that God has in store for those who love him. That's what the scripture says. So right now what I'm trying to say is that I has not, just tell you, look at your neighbor, tell I has not seen. <laughs> Ear has not heard. Mind has not conceived. Yeah. You might, think, you might think by the way that your mind has conceived. Your mind has not conceived the things that God has for you. As we begin to follow God, as we begin to lean into God's revival and what God is doing, I believe that the things God is about to do will shake you, will shock you. Right now, 
where you are, when you look a few years from now, you will laugh. <laughs> just, just look at your neighbor and laugh a bit at them. Like, just laugh. Like, it's hilarious who they are right now compared to who God wants them to be. That's what this scripture is saying. What the scripture is saying. The things God has prepared for who? For those who love him. As you lean into God. As we lean into him by praying. Because that's what we do. We are just positioning ourselves to be with God. Remember when I described my prayer, I spent so little time praying for myself. I want, I'm just praying about being with God. I'm loving him. I'm thanking him. I'm honoring him. I'm confessing sin. That's when you love, when you love God, you pray. Amen. When you love God, you, you're sharing the gospel because you're aligning your heart to his heart. His heart is that people will be saved. And that's where you are. You're one of those who love him. You're visiting people. Jesus came and he visited. He went to where people were. You're doing what he does. And then now you're getting into the place of devoting yourself to teaching, to understanding, to being transformed by the renewal of your mind. And then now you're getting into the place where the supernatural, you're beginning to expect the supernatural. You're walking not like those people who believe that miracles are a thing that happened in the Old Testament, the New Testament. You believe that they happen now in your generation and you're praying for them, for people with boldness. And as you're walking in that place, the Bible says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived. So even me, as I share these, I want to say that these are the things that God has shown me, but I believe they're just the beginning. My suspicion is they're just the beginning, but this is kind of what I'm sensing. So I believe we are on the verge of a great revival, people. And it will be marked by several things. Number one, spiritual gift, spiritual growth. Spiritual growth. I believe it will be marked with spiritual growth. You know, as we pray together every week, because 2020, 20, well, we're going to keep praying. That 430 will continue. But I suspect God is going to move some of you and it will become 330. I just, I just believe it. You'll be praying before, before guys come onto the call. You'll already, you'll already have been there. You'll just be praying and then you'll join people praying, but you'll have already been praying. As we're seeking God, and by the way, it's not your psych, it's like God just, he's going to start doing to you what he does to me. <laughs> the other day, I was telling my exec team on Wednesday when I came for the exec meeting, I woke up in a heart, I woke up like startled, because I usually startle at three. So I woke up, and I was like, oh my God, oh my God, okay, I'm, I'm late. So I went, I read the Bible for an hour like I usually do, and then I, 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 I went now, I'm going to wake up my wife, because I usually wake her up at around 4.30 so she can join the prayer, uh, if she hasn't woken up. So as I'm going up, I looked at my clock, at my watch to see the time. It was two o'clock. Like God woke me up at one and I didn't even know. And so I was like, oh, I can't wake her up now. And I'm too awake. So what do I do? I just went and prayed. And I prayed and I prayed until 4.30. Then I joined people for prayer. Are you understanding what I'm saying? That day, I came to work. I was like, will I even manage? I've been up the whole night praying. Well, literally. I came and the meeting, I led the meeting the whole day, the team can tell you. We had an amazing meeting, didn't we? And then we did family night, and I went home, and I still had energy. I drove my wife all the way home, and I was like, oh my goodness, where did this, I'm like a 20-year-old. Guys, I'm actually not a young man. <laughs> they that wait upon the Lord, shall renew their strength. So I believe this is a year of spiritual growth. 2022 will be a year of spiritual growth. And as we pray together every week, as we listen to his word, I declare we will grow spiritually as a result. 2022 will be the year that many of us will grow so much we will not recognize ourselves. You will do things that you will not even understand. You'll be looking at yourself and saying, how am I doing these things? People sitting around you are going to look very differently from you. And I believe that here are some of the things you're growing. You're growing your love for God and your confidence in his love. There's some of us who have struggled with acceptance, struggled with self-esteem. I believe that this coming year, God is going to reveal himself to you in such powerful ways, you'll walk around in confidence as a disciple that Jesus loved. Okay, you don't even understand this. Just note it down because when you, when you look at, back at the notes, you'll be able to say, okay, now I get it. You will have that confidence in your Father's love. We'll grow in your knowledge of his word and you'll become a prayer warrior. You never saw yourself as a prayer warrior. You thought it was for those spooky guys who just have prophetic visions. You are just an ordinary Christian. Come on, God will start giving you prophetic oh, visions in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. This coming year, you're going to actually start getting prophetic visions. Amen. They're going to become commonplace in this congregation. Amen. And you will grow in your knowledge in his, of his word. You will also grow in your confidence as a person and you'll become a bold evangelist. Wow. 
Hey, I'm talking to the introverts in the house. You will be a bold introvert. Uh, you will be such a bold evangelist. You'll be telling people you're an introvert. They'll be bursting out laughing. That's not who you are. They'll be telling you. And you will lead people to Christ, by the way. In fact, I want to speak over every one of you. You will lead people to Christ. Many people in 2022. Yeah, you will lead them. Some of you are even like me. How? Yes, you will. Watch this space. Because it's not you who will do it. It is God who will do it. You will grow in your commitment to your faith and to your church. These are some of the things. By the way, as I pray, these are the declarations God gave me to speak over you. So even as I'm saying, I'm, I'm informing you, but I'm also speaking them over you. Because this is what the Lord instructed me to do. You will grow in your enjoyment of your faith and your enjoyment of godly friendships. Amen. Some of you, right now, your friendships are not godly friendships. You're surrounded by friends that do not support you in your walk with the Lord. And I believe that the Lord is stripping out, he's going to strip away some of those and give you friendships who will help you grow in your faith. Some of you, even as couples, God will give you couple friendships that will help you grow in your faith. So this is a year when God is about to reposition you in the family in that way. And some of those, many of those friendships will be here in this house. You will grow in your generosity. As you trust God for provision, you will see God coming through for you. So I'm, I, I want to declare that next 2022 will be a year of divine economy. Amen. You'll actually be walking in favor and even wondering how that's happening. Because remember, we are positioning ourselves, isn't it? We've, posi we've, we've declared that we're getting out of debt in 2022. So some of the things that will happen, no eye has seen, no ear has heard. People will ask you, how did you do it? You'll say, I don't know. Amen. I don't know. Only God did it. You will grow in your experience and practice of the miraculous. Not only will you experience God's miracles, but you will be a convener of God's miracles. You lay hands on people and you will see miracles happening. These are, these are God's declarations over you. Like I said, I prayed and these are the words God gave me to speak over you as a church. And then you will get out of debt and you will become healthy financially. Oh my goodness, next year at this time, I'll be preaching to guys who are easy, they're relaxed, they're out of debt, they're not worrying about phone calls by landlords. This time, this time next year. Ah, yeah, the guys who are doubting at the back, I'm talking to you right now. Those of you at the back there, even you guys on this side, I'm talking about you right now. Next year, this time. Next year, this time. Watch. By the way, I'm even wondering whether we'll have a full day just to give financial testimony next year. Yeah. Watch. Watch what happens. I wouldn't tell you this if I didn't believe God has said it. And it is the truth. Spiritual growth is your first one. Number two, culture shift culture shift. 2022 will be the most joyous year of your Christian life so far as we begin church as a family. This church as a family thing is going to change, revolutionize our experience of the community of God. And for many of us, you're going to testify, this has been, like, why wasn't I doing this before? Uh, this will be a joyous year of your faith. People will enjoy coming to your campus. They will even be coming early to get seats and book some for their friends. That's your church I'm talking about. Yeah, they'll be coming early to get seats. And church will stop being a Sunday event and every day will become a day of ministry. Now, now guys, I may not be speaking spookily and saying, thus says the Lord, but this is God's word. Huh? So just receive it because this is your word. People will be coming because of the love they feel in your campus. They'll just want to come and hang around you guys. This will be the testimony in your church. Everyone at Mavuno will have someone who is discipling them helping them to grow spiritually, and many will also have people who they are discipling. Uh, this will be a family of discipleship, and you'll be seeing people becoming like you. By the way, that's a, that's a funnest thing. Follow me as I follow Christ. Some of you are like, I don't have anything I want people to follow right now. Trust me, God is going to help you grow. Because you'll be following, and other people will be following you. So this is going to be a, an amazing nursery. This will be a place full of spiritual babies. And you'll be bringing up people. We'll just be bringing up people in the Lord. Um, our pastors will love serving in their campuses. This is, this is specific for pastors. You will love serving in your campus because of the love of your people for you. This is what God is saying. I'm not hearing the people themselves saying it, but the pastors are receiving it. <laughs> you know, sometimes, let me tell you, pastoring can be hard. It can be one of the most, actually leadership in general can be a very unappreciated task. Leading people is not easy. That's why I pray for the president, by the way. Because let me tell you, leading, when you're a leader, 
Like I always say, this small church has bothered me like this. I wonder what it's like to lead a country. <laughs> it can give you sleep. Like I, sometimes I even pray for his health. Do you ever look at him and think he doesn't even look healthy? Yeah. Like this, the country is stressful. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's hard. Leadership is hard on people. And I think that's why sometimes leaders end up turning inwards. Yeah. And you find leaders looking after themselves, their families, promoting their own people. Because it's like, ah, let me just look after myself because nobody cares. But let me tell you, that will not be the portion of any leader in Mavono Church. Yeah, it's not our portion. In Jesus' name. People would love being your pastor. Like your pastor would be saying, I'm glad to be your pastor. That's actually God's, that's God's word for you. Because of the kind of people that you will be. Uh, miracles will become commonplace in your campuses. Yeah, they will happen. <laughs> they will happen. Now, please note them down. Eh? Because I want you to be able to note and to be able to testify that I, you had these words from me. You had them here. <clears throat> and let me say the last one here. We will become known as a people of honor. We will honor our leaders and we'll honor each other, blessing each other with gifts and love. Amen. This will no longer become something practiced among a few top leaders, but become the common practice of the church. Amen. And I believe this is something the Lord has said will happen Amen. in the Mavuna churches. That there will be such places of honor and blessing. And there will be fun places to be. But let me tell you, when you're in a place where there's honor, it's a fun place to be. It's an easy place. Because when people honor each other, they're not, they're not, they're not competing with each other. They're, they're, they're humble. They're not, they're not trying to show each other anything. It's like I honor the person in authority over me and I bless him. And the leader doesn't have to prove themselves. So the leader is relaxed because they know that my people honor me. So I don't need to try and do anything to show them that I'm all that. And because they're relaxed, they're genuine. And the place becomes a place that is open for God to move. So I believe this is what's going to be happening in all our churches. And so this is, this is God's word for us, people. And I, the, the verse I, that God gave me, Hebrews 10, 25, we should not stop gathering together with other believers as some of you are doing. Oy, okay, I don't know if it's some of the ones in here. Maybe, maybe some of the ones out there. <laughs> we should not stop gathering together. This is what this version says, with other believers as some of you are doing. This could have been written after COVID. Huh? Instead, we must continue to encourage each other even more as we see the day of the Lord coming. And so I really do believe in this season, God is telling us, don't get stuck at home. Don't become your little independent uh, entity out there. This is the time for you to lean into the family. And God will bless us as this shift happens. Uh, and let me say, next year we're going to have several gatherings. I've, I've, I've intimated on that. The first one, just write this date, Feb 1st to 4th. Feb 1st to 4th. Uh, it's, it's a fast four-day <laughs> intensive. And... and I want you to ask your boss for leave. I know, they will never say yes. But in Jesus' name, we are praying that they will say yes. Amen. And you won't even have to lie and say it. It's because you're going to visit or see your sick where, no, or someone has died. You just tell them, there's a program in our church. You tell them the truth. There's a program in our church, and I am a leader, and I'd like to be there. And the boss will actually, t and, and I'll be praying for this business to succeed when I'm there. Amen. That's what you'll tell your boss, and they will give you the time off. But just tell them the way I've told you, by the way. Don't add things. Just tell them the way I've told you. A, and some of them might even be shocked. You're in church. You're a church person. It's okay. Don't worry. No judgment. In fact, that's your opportunity to just evangelize your boss. <laughs> Share with them about Jesus. Uh, it'll be here at Hill City. It'll be here at Hill City. And so for those who are in other countries, I'm actually inviting you. Uh, that's a normal time when we do our staff retreat. We're not having a staff retreat this year. We're going to have, a, like next year, we're having a leaders gathering like this. And it's going to be four days. So you guys are going to be here with all our pastors from across the world and leadership teams. And it's going to be a fantastic international gathering by God's grace. So right, right. And, and there are Airbnbs, by the way, all over this place. It's like funny because when we moved here, we thought the only way we'll make this place work is if we build a 200-bed hotel. It was part of our plan. You know what God said? God gave us Kolo this, this place, Great Wall and Koloho. Koloho has that hotel already. But Great Wall has like a thousand Airbnbs, I think. So we have enough hotel beds here that anyone who comes here can have an inexpensive place. So even those of you who are coming from life, we have to Airbnb together. Yeah, 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 yeah. For those four days, you just board here. Boarding and lodging. Don't go far. Don't try and travel to the other part of town. Rongai. Just stay here. <laughs> you'll come with your team and you'll just stay here. And we'll learn together. So that's it. And then the next one will be June 4th to 8th. June 4th to 8th. And then we'll do one final one in November. So I'm giving you the dates early so that you can plan for them. And uh, by God's grace, we'll make them happen. Okay, church growth. Number three, church growth. 
November's day, we don't have, I don't have the date yet, but around, around third week, yeah, around third week. Because <laughs> so I said in a year's time, so we can't do it before, we have to do it then. Okay, so right third week for now, third week of November, we'll give the final dates. Okay, as we do evangelism, this is church growth, and each discipleship group brings one person to Christ, we will see all our campuses explode next year in growth. People will come in who are hungry for Jesus. Salvations will become commonplace in our churches. I'm not hearing amens. Yeah. All our family members will be drawn to God. Those of you who are family members who are not saved, next year, just start to join this prayer right now and begin to agree with this prayer. Next year is a year of salvation for your family. Uh, and because we're recording our fam- we're, we're recording, our f- we're, we're recording, by the way, uh, the numbers of salvations. And for us, our, my prayer is we'll get to a place where a thousand people are coming to Christ every week. Every week. Every week. Because of our campuses. And I believe by God's grace it will happen. And so as we lean in, God has said next year is a year of salvation. I see us filling all our current buildings and having to look for new venues. Yeah. All of them will become small. Next year, all our venues will become small. Uh, we will fill them and God will help us to either plant churches or expand and look out for other venues or something. But next year, that will begin to happen, and we'll see it happening. Uh, I see, and, and I, I sense that God is saying next year, many people will start churches at home. And they won't start churches at home because they don't want to come to church, but those are to, to, to meet with others. They'll start because they know their friends and their family members will never come to a church like this. And so they start at home deliberately to reach those people who won't come to church. And what is going to happen, they are going to be shepherding their friends, their neighbors, their family members, their colleagues. Playing the service, we'll just be, you'll just be taking the service that we do online and play it and then have snacks afterwards. And people would love coming to your house. By the way, even some of your office colleagues, they'll just love coming to hang out with you on Sunday. And so your house will become a house of salvation. Altar calls will be done in your sitting room. God's spirit will dwell there and become a habitation for him. And that's going to happen. In fact, some of those churches will start as little houses in your living room. They will outgrow your living room. And they'll actually become churches. I, please note these things down. Eh? When you start to see them, you'll say, the Lord showed them to us. We knew. We knew they were happening. Number four, financial freedom. Amen. Financial freedom. Uh, God gave me a word that we would be out of debt by September 2022, although many before. By the way, is anybody who has, has already gone out of debt as you're trusting God? Okay. I can see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a few hands. Praise. Come on. Let's give God to glory to God. Yeah. Already. It's happening. It's happening. Their hands are across the room. Even in the next six, six weeks to the end of the year, or oh, it's five, even in the next five weeks, some of you will miraculously be out of debt. Uh, even in the next five weeks. And by the way, you'll be shocked how it will happen. Uh, yes, you have your plan and you're working your plan because you need to have your plan and you're working it. We talked about that. But as you're working it, God will accelerate it. But by this time when we meet next year, we're trusting God that every single one of us, our debt will be extinguished. Um, and, and here's the thing. I, want, I believe God wants us to be financially free for a reason. It's not so that we can be such cool people, so that we can just be rich, name it and claim it. That's not why. God wants us to be financially free so we can have the power to go out and make disciples across the nations. Did you hear what I said? Yes. The power to make disciples. Go out and make disciples across the nation. Imagine when you have no debt and you're financially free, you can do things for the kingdom you can't do right now. Uh, Pastor Kilon's invited us to go to uh, Kampala, and he challenged some people in his church, and he said, we're going, raise your ticket. And because they could afford their ticket, they raised their ticket and we went. That's what happens when you don't have debt. I'll be able to say, I've got a mission trip. I'm going to Ukraine. I want people in Mavuno to come with me. And a delegation of you, a hundred of you will come and we go. Because you're free to serve God. You buy your ticket, you pay your hotel room, and we go. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Some of you, that sounds like a dream, but imagine it's going to happen. It will happen. We'll go and preach the gospel across the world because you're financially free. Or God will say, I want you to open up, to, to do something to bless the poor children in your neighborhood. You won't just pray. You will do something. You'll have the ability to do something. So he wants to bless us so we can be a blessing. A time is coming when this church, okay, let me say it this way. Uh, a time is coming when this church will be full of kingdom millionaires and billionaires. Uh, the Lord began to show me that. Yeah. And, and, and these, these ones, he began to show me like some of the things coming in the longer term. A time is coming when one family will donate land for Mavuno campus and another family will donate the money to build the campus. So, so, 
So it wouldn't be like we did a Harambe or we gathered people together, we did a, final, a financial campaign. Just one family will say, build it, and it will be built. Because of the way the Lord will bless us. That's why, by the way, the Lord is positioning us financially. For the sake of the kingdom. This is what he wants. This is what he wants. By the way, some of you come from families that did that. Your grandfathers are the ones who donated the land in the village that the church was built in. Surely, that's your heritage. And if it's not, it can start with you. Your grandkids can be saying, my grandfather is the one who gave Mavuno, Mavuno Rongai. My grandfather is the one who gave the land for that church. Yeah. Amen. And it becomes the heritage of your family. And so let's become kingdom builders. A time is coming when many of you will only need to work a few hours a week in your business. And the majority of your time will be spent in ministry. Because you will be so effective in your work that the few hours will be more than enough to sustain your family. Uh, God clearly gave me that word. And he, he, I, I believe he's putting it out so that it can become something that you aspire to in your prayer. That God will actually bless the work of your hands so much that you just need to do one little thing and it has enough money that you can do ministry the rest of the week. Wow. This is what God wants of us, that we will actually be, all be ministers because we are blessed. Why, why aren't people ministers? Why aren't Christians ministers? Because they're chasing after money, isn't it? I'm too busy with my job to do what God wants me to do. But imagine God making you so effective that four hours of your week is enough. And the rest, you're out there serving and doing ministry. This is the time that is coming. And I really believe that as we've prayed about this one, God would also want to, us to trust him to get out of debt as a church. Wow. That by this time next year, Amen. actually not by this time, by September next year, because I say this time next year in September, by September next year, we will have completely extinguished our debt. Now, here's a crazy thing about our debt. Pastor James, if you could send me that, just pass me that place where I'd written this numbers down that Nick gave me. I don't know where you kept it. But it's interesting because our debt, we took a debt when we came here. Some of you are not part of the story of Mavuno, but uh, from those days, you joined it more recently. But we were in a place called Bellevue. It was a beautiful place, lovely driving cinema. But I could tell there was a setup. Things were just, there was a spiritual, major spiritual war happening on the land. I could tell that this was not the place God wanted us to settle long term. And I could tell God was saying, it's time. It just do something. Move. This is not it. And so with a small group of people, some of whom are in this room, we began to look for land. And we found this land. And at that point, it was an impossible, impossible amount. The land cost, uh, I think it was 200 million. And then we needed another 100. It was such rough, raw land with nothing on it. We needed another 150 million just to fence it, put a parking, put a few classes, put this fence, uh, this tent. Not even major development, just some of the things that came on this property. Um, we came to the church and we said, we don't have what it takes. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to trust God to bless us miraculously so that we can own the land. And we started off on a campaign to raise that money. I remember as a young pastor, I just... I was, my heart was shaking. Those numbers, you know when you see it written down, there are many zeros. Yeah. 350 million, those are many zeros. Yeah. When you're young, it sounds like a small amount. When you, as you grow older, you're like, eh. I know a million is not a little money. 350 million, those are many monies. And so I remember we made pledges, and by God's grace, the pledges actually came to even more than that amount. And so we began the journey, and we fundraised. And I want to say a crazy thing. First of all, that we raised an incredible amount. We raised, I think it was 220 million shillings wow. for this land. Like, it was such sacrificial giving. People sold cars, people sold land, people sold houses, just people convicted by the Holy Spirit that they would create a place that would become an altar for the Most High. And we did this campaign called Count Me In. And, I mean, 220 million, that's crazy, isn't it? That's a lot of money. And with that, because of that, we we're able to pay off the land and even to buy a lot of the stuff you see around here. But at the end, we ended up taking a loan, and it wasn't my desire to take it. But what happened is because the pledges were coming in still, and people had pledged over some time, we thought, okay, let's take a bridging loan so we can move, because we were being kicked out where we were. And so we took that loan. Now, in, in hindsight, and in light of what I taught three months ago, I probably wouldn't have done it. I think I would have thought of a different way. But at that point, it, was, it seemed like the best way to go. And so we took the loan, and we paid, and that was helpful. We got into a deal with HF, uh, who, a bank, who were able to give us that loan. And so we began to pay off our mortgage. Now, here's the crazy thing. I told you that there was some serious, intense spiritual warfare in this land. It was so serious that it scattered many people. 
And many people just were confused. People just left. People, <laughs> it was just people started saying, oh, it's far. They went to other churches. And many of those who left had made pledges and didn't fulfill them. Now, you know what? For me, I don't blame. I actually say this is just what happened. Maybe there are things we could have done differently. By God's grace, we've been able to be very faithful in paying our mortgage. We've never missed a payment. Our mortgage payments are about 2.2 million shillings every month. And we've been doing that for the last seven years. So out of the, the, the because what we ended up borrowing, we ended up borrowing 170 million shillings uh, just to be able to bridge um, some of the other things that we found on the land when we got here. And when we borrowed it, we started paying it. We've been paying it consistently. Uh, out of, the, two, out, out of the, the money, I mean, out of, let me just see, out of the money we, we paid, uh, I think our current bill, we've paid 154 million. So be, uh, apart from the 122, we, raised, we paid 154 million, just consistently out of those 2.2s, and people sometimes giving a generous gift, sometimes people just come and say, God has blessed my business, this is my bonus, put it towards this. Uh, like I said, last year, God, God blessed Karo and I, and we were able to give the end of our pledge. So some, some people have consistently just come up and said, God convicted me, I felt like I needed to complete. And so people, people have been giving, and people have been generous. And we've been able to raise $154 million. Our current loan, however, is 143 And this is what I was trying to explain to you guys that happens with banks. Because that money we've been paying has been going to pay off interest. By the time you get to your principal, every month you're paying interest. And I think what we've calculated is by the time we finish paying that loan of 170, we'll have paid 330. That's almost double what we borrowed. And so even though we are faithful, we're like, that's cramping us. Because every month we have to take money from our campuses to pay that mortgage. And when God gave me this word and said, next year you'll be out of debt, my goodness, I almost cried. I rejoiced. I said, Lord, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We need this. We need this. To God be the glory. Amen. I desire to see our campuses owning their own land. Yeah. Why can't Kampala be on its own space? Yeah. Yes. You will have your own land. Yeah. Why, why should you be hustling with landlords? Why? You need to have your own space. I desire to see Lifeway. Lifeway, you guys need to own your own land. Yeah, you do. You do. And be in a space where you have a space where young people can come the whole week. Be, 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 you can, even a school, somewhere where you can even educate. Right now, these guys have an incredible schools ministry, by the way. And they're doing a fantastic work just discipling every... How many, how many children are you guys discipling? At the moment, 237 children every week. They're discipling them. And God is, God is just gracious. And I pray that God will give you your own land and your own building. Uh, and that he will settle you. I pray that Lovington will have its own building. Yeah, Lovington, you need your own building. You guys, uh, God has been gracious. He's put you in a school. They've been gracious to us. But it's a temporary space. And I believe we need to say to the community in Lovington, we're here to stay. We're not temporary. And when the Lord establishes you, that will be the place where even the people in that area would feel they're going to their space. And so like, we can trust God, even in Lovington, we'll have space and we'll have land. That's what God wants for us, amen. These guys right now, they've been given a school to do discipleship in. With how many students? About 1,700. 1,700 students. They're running a service every week. What? You guys are not even understand. 1,700 students. Like every week, they've just been told, come and preach to these students. Disciple them. Do help us. And you know, if you know anything about our school system right now, our, our schools, they're struggling to figure out how to anchor their, their children ethically. Kids are burning buildings. And so they're like, anybody who can actually give us solutions, and we know we have the solution. We know that if, if we disciple these kids, none of them will ever burn a school building again. And we're trusting God that God would give us land. But for us to get the land, we have to be free of this debt. And so one of the things I'm trusting God is next year, by this time, we will be dancing by September. We'll be having a party. We'll be holding the document from the bank. And we'll even burn that document. We'll actually just put it on fire and say it is finished in Jesus' name. It's gone. And now we are free to do the things God wants us to do. And this is our land, all of us, even for those who are watching internationally. This is your space. Because God has called us to be a global movement, we need a HQ. This is what's going to enable us to even get the other places we're going to buy across the world. So, so 
why I'm saying all this is because as we prayed, God gave us um, a thought. And this thought is a very, it's a thought that God has really just put on our hearts. And this thought came out of, as, and actually, Kev the Rev and I were probably the first ones to discuss this. And as we prayed, I just felt in my spirit, this is what God is saying for us in this season. And the scripture that God gave me is Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9. I'll read a couple, but this one is the one that came to my mind first. Proverbs 3, 9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the fast fruits of all your produce. Yeah. That's a scripture God gave me. But then there's a couple of other verses. Nehemiah 10, 35. Nehemiah was, uh, these are the people of Israel. And they were building the wall that had crumbled. And they were now beginning to rebuild a broken city. And they said, we obligate ourselves to bring the fast fruits of our ground and the fast fruits of all fruit of every tree year by year to the house of the Lord. Yeah. I thought that was very powerful. These were builders. Yeah. They were family builders. And they decided, we're going to do this every year. Deuteronomy 18, verse 4, the fast fruits of your grain, of your wine, and of your oil, and the fast fleece of your sheep, you shall give to him. Yeah. They belong to God. So this, this concept of fast fruits, it's rooted in, it's rooted in, in biblical times. Huh? And people were, were farmers, so they would give their agricultural produce. And it basically meant that when it, your, your crops came up, the very fast fruits, the ones that you rejoice because you've been waiting for, those ones you said, I give every part of this, I give it to the Lord. And when they did that, basically, they were literally reaping, they took what they had sowed and they sent that to the priest. And God called them to yield this as an offering to demonstrate their obedience and their reverence to him. The, the Hebrew word for fast fruit is bikurim, bikurim. And what it means, when it's translated literally, it means the promise that is to come. The promise that is to come. So as they gave it, there was a promise that was attached to it. They were linking themselves to their future. This is what they were doing. The Israelites saw these fast fruits as freeing the future of interference. It was a way that they could actually uh, uh, make sure that God was on their, like God protected the rest of their crop. God told them if they bought their fast fruits to him, he would bless all that came afterwards. And if you read the first five books of the Bible, Moses mentions fast fruits. He teaches them about fast, fast fruits about five different, uh, actually 13 different times. And it's mentioned throughout the Old Testament and it's even referenced in the New Testament. Now in the New Testament, a twist happens with this concept because the term fast fruits begin to take on a symbolic meaning. In 1 Corinthians 15, 20, Paul mentions Christ as the first fruit of all who have fallen asleep. In other words, of all the people who've died, Christ is the first fruit. What does that mean? It means Jesus was God's first fruit, God's best. God took his best and offered it to those he loved. So God could have taken anybody, but he took the best of his produce, like he, his only son, the Bible says. And Jesus becomes the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. He gave that one to humanity. In the same way that we sacrifice our best for him, he sacrificed his best for us. So that's how fast fruits, we start to read about it in the New Testament. And so what happened as a specific instruction for bringing crops to the priest every year, it's expanded on uh, in scripture. It stops being just about literal fruits. You find fast fruits now becomes income, wealth, blessings that Christians have received, the best of what they have, and they offer to God. And there's a difference between fast fruit and tithing, because sometimes people confuse the two. But tithing, it meant you give a tenth of your income to the church. And we talked about that, so I won't go into too much of it, a few months ago. The tithe was the way that they connected themselves to the covenant. It's the way that they said, I belong. Just the same way that your tax is what connects you to your country. When you pay that tax, I can't, if I'm a Kenyan and I'm working here, I can't pay tax to the Ugandan government. That is not the way it's done. Uh, the Kenyan government would even arrest me, uh, because it's like you eat here, you pay here. <laughs> that's, what, that's what the tithe is. It's basically you give it in the house of God and it has the benefits of the citizen. Yeah. Uh, because just like when you pay your taxes, your, your country is meant to provide certain benefits. It doesn't always happen globally. <laughs> but they're supposed to provide, actually they do happen because you're getting roads, isn't it? I was in Uganda, I was driving on, on a very nice road. So it be, there are benefits that are promised to you because you pay your taxes. In the kingdom, there are benefits that are paid when you tithe. The Bible says the Lord will, re, will accelerate your, your, your investments, and I've preached about this, so I won't go into detail, but he'll also protect them from the devourer. So there are some things that happen when you, and that's why we, as, ch as a church, we say that we are people who are tithers. That's my destiny. By the way, I'm a tither. I will never be anything else, because I believe that I have to give, I have to give my tithe. This is, it's also the way I, I declare that I belong to the kingdom. 
Now, fast fruit is different. Fast fruit is, in a sense, uh, an annual, it's, 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 it's an, it can be an annual gift to the church done at harvest time because these people had an, an, an annual harvest. And what we're doing, even though we're not harvesting crops, it could be that thing that you prayed for a job and God gave you a job. And I've seen many of you do this. You got that job and you say, the first salary I got from this job, I'm giving it to God. And I've seen people bringing their first salary to church and saying, this is my first fruit. Or I got a new a bonus uh, at work. And it, was, it, it just came and God really blessed me. And I said, I'm bringing this bonus check to church. I've seen people who started a business and the first client that paid them. And they say, this check belongs to the Lord. And they brought it as a fast fruit to the Lord. So that's how people practice. Uh, or, or maybe you've just received the first dividends from an investment. And you say, this thing, this is it. Or you've put up a house and you got rent. And your first rent check. And you say, this is my fast fruit. It's something you do to honor God. It is not an obligation are you understanding? Yeah. If I find that you're a Christian who is not tithing, I'll tell you you're a disobedient Christian. Yeah. If I find you're a Christian who's not giving a uh, fast fruit, I will not call you a disobedient Christian. Because a, a fast fruit is not an obligatory yeah. thing. It's not something that is required of you as a Christian. Whenever you decide to do it, you must do it freely with no guilt or obligation. Yeah. It's something that you do. It's supposed to celebrate what the Lord has given you. Yeah. It's supposed to be saying, thank you, Lord. <laughs> Thank you. You've been so good to me. You're so faithful. It's a celebration of what God has done. And when you do it, you're, you're giving something above your tithe, but you're saying, Lord, this is just to celebrate the fact that everything I have comes from you. Genesis chapter 4, verse 3 to 5, it says, In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor upon Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was angry and his face was downcast. Now, this is a famous story. Two, two brothers, one is a farmer, one is a fruit grower. One brings fruit, one brings meat, and the one who brought fruit, God does, rejects. And sometimes people think it's because God likes meat and doesn't like vegetables. And so that's why they eat. God is not a vegetarian. That is not what the story is teaching us. If you've ever had that, it was a lie. That is wrong exegesis. That's not what the Bible is teaching. Basically, what happens is Cain brings some of his fruit and vegetables. The implication there is he's eaten, he's full, and he just brings some of the leftovers, and he brings them to God. But the Bible says Cain takes choice portions from, some, from the firstborn of his flock. This guy has worked hard. He's brought up his flock. He should be rejoicing because he's gotten the first flock. But he says the choice portions of this belongs to God. And God sees not the, it's not the, 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 it's not that one is meat and one is vegetables. But it's that God looks at the heart and he says, look at what this guy gave. He gave from his best. He gave from his first fruits. And he looks at this other guy and he says he gave probably out of obligation. He looked at his brother and he said, I won't be left behind. Let me at least give something. And the Bible says God was not pleased with that. Now Cain, of course, gets it all wrong. He gets it all twisted. He doesn't know God is a God of a second chance. And he ends up killing his brother. That's a whole other story. But here's the thing I want to make, the bigger point, that fast fruit means I put God first, even before my, myself and my family. When I make a fast fruit offering, it allows God to work in my life. I approach God with open hands rather than with clenched, clenched fists. And that allows God to do what he wants with my finances. It's like you're saying, God, the rest of this, you look after it. That's what I'm doing. And it shows gratitude. I think the thing I don't want you to forget is that it shows gratitude. Uh, tithe was never, there was no, I mean, gratitude was not really attached. It was just, you just pay your tithe. But with, with your fast fruit, it's a way of just saying, God, <sighs> yeah, thank you. This is from you. Now, how do you give a fast fruit offering? Number one, you pray. I always tell people, pray. Don't just do it because everybody else is doing That's what Cain did. Didn't work well for him. <laughs> that guy would have been better staying home. <laughs> Bringing that offering did not help him. So pray. And allow, allow your heart to be right before God. But then number two, prepare. Um, Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 4. This is a very powerful verse because it says, When you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. So God is saying when you make that vow, do it. You don't want to bring judgment on yourself. So when you make a vow of a fast fruit, always fulfill it. And fulfill it quickly. Uh, don't give excuses. That, that's why, by the way, over this last few years, I've been having such a burden. I was like, I made a commitment to Mavuno. I have to fulfill it. 
I have to fulfill it. And by God's grace, I was so, my wife can tell you I was so happy. When I told her that day, she was just like, my God, God is so faithful. Uh, I was very happy to do it. Um, Proverbs, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 21. If you make a vow to the Lord your God, do not be slow to pay it, for the Lord your God will certainly demand it of you, and you'll be guilty of sin. Ananias and Sapphira did that. They made a vow, and then they kind of reconsidered it. And it would have been better for them not to have made the vow, <laughs> you know? So make it and keep it. Now, it's not saying don't make it, but make it and keep it. I think that's what the Lord is saying. And then I'll move to the next thing, prioritize. The whole idea of a fast fruit is to put God first. So when you donate, I mean, I know pastors here who give their fast fruit offering uh, every year to Mavuno. And I know I can name them. Uh, some of them have done that for years. Where every year, my January salary, it comes to Mavuno. And they just say, don't pay me my January salary. And that's just a way that they prioritize it. It's a, it's a way of saying, you know what, I don't even want to, be, to play around with it. I'm going to live by faith. And by the way, January, as we know in this country, we call it in January, which means hungry month. Uh, but somehow, by God's grace, I've seen those pastors thrive. I've seen God bless them. It's just that I didn't want them, so I won't ask them to come here and give testimonies. But this is what uh, God is saying. Put, put it first, prioritize. And then institutionalize it. Now, here's the thing I've come to learn. For me, I want to honor God, not spontaneously. I really want to honor God with my life. So I've actually institutionalized a fast food offering. I'm like, and, and by the way, okay, the reason I'm saying... I'm not as, I'm, you know, I used to give a fast food offering until I gave it all. <laughs> so now I give all my salary. So it's not like every month. It's like every first year of the, the, the first salary of the year I give. Because right now I just give it uh, the whole salary. But I'm saying you can actually prioritize and say to God, every year I will do this. Now here's what I sense God, the word God gave to me. I sensed that at Mavuno, God may not have us ever do fundraising. In this country, we call them Harambe call people, politicians or whoever, to come and help us raise money to build churches. That will not honor the Lord. And it is not our way. And I, I pray even when I'm gone that Mavuno will never do that. That's not our culture. But I believe that the Lord has several ways he will provide for this church. Number one, your tithes and your offerings are the ones that will run the ministry of this church. By the way, just with your tithes and offerings, we will never need to take donations from people. We'll never be calling donors, Americans, to come and help us. We will be able to pay all our bills, our obligations, pay our staff, do all that this church needs to do. Do our missions, everything. Anything we get from, the, from helpers, from donors and others, it will be to help us get there faster. But it will be those ones of, even if you don't do it, we'll still get there. We might just take a year longer, but we'll get there. Are you getting what I'm saying? Because I believe God wants, as an African people, we must be dignified. I think, I think even ministries sometimes do what our governments do, which is go with begging bowls to the West. And I don't believe that honors God. And so I say this not just for here in Nairobi, but I say it for across the movement. We must become a dignified movement. We don't want to bring shame and dishonor to God's name uh, by becoming beggars. I believe that, yes, we will receive gifts, but we will also give gifts. Yeah. Yes, we'll be blessed, but we'll also become blessers. Yeah. And we'll bless people across the world because that's who God is calling us to be. So your tithes will help us do that. But here's what I sense, and this is the thing I really I, I, I struggle with and prayed about, and I feel that I want to share with you today. I believe that our fast fruits is what God will use to build this church in terms of the institution, in terms of capital expenses, in terms of buying land, in terms of buying, uh, putting up buildings, that we'll actually get to the place where just because of our fast fruits, we'll be putting up, we'll be doing five, 10, 15 buildings at the same time for different campuses across the world, just because of our fast fruits as a movement. And so here's what I want to challenge us uh, to consider. Uh, this, is, this is a word, the phrase that God gave me. The phrase that God gave me was, free the future. Free the future. That's what fast fruits do. They free the future. I believe that God wants us to have a free future, a debt-free future. And that's for us individually, but also for us as a community. And so how are we going to free the future? I believe that as we give our, our fast fruits, we are sowing into that freeing the future. We're saying, God, I will bless you, take this step of faith, and trust you to free me personally and my family from debt, but also to free our church from debt. And this year, our focus is going to be on debt elimination. If that's all we do, praise God, we'll have a party. Next year, we may start building. In Jesus' name, I see us building, by the way. 
yeah, we need to. We need to. Pastor James can tell you there's no, there is no recreation in this area. Yeah. This property, we see it becoming a major hub for recreation with thousands of people every day of the week. We see basketball courts. We see uh, soccer courts. We see maybe even a hospital, uh, a, a place for medical. Just, we, we want this to become a blessing in the community in such a way that if any government of the day ever tries to interfere with Mavuno, there will be a protest here in all these neighbors. This is what this land will be. But I believe that that will be the portion for every place where Mavuno Church is. That is God's intention for us. So we free the future. And so what I want to challenge you to do is that this coming year, you would all consider giving a fast fruit offering to this church. That's the prayer. This is how we free our future, people. This is how we free our future. Now, for some of you, you've never taken a risky step like this. And I understand, even when you think about it, maybe your stomach gets somersault. Uh, you get, you get some, some, you're like, how will you even live? January, I've never done anything like that. But here's the thing. Those of us who've done it, yeah. and those of us who've walked this journey, some of you guys have been around long enough. We've done this enough. When we were a very new church, just about two years old, three years old, we had to raise 30 million shillings yeah. to move to Bellevue. We are such a young church, just about 300 of us. Yeah. Like when you do the maths, it makes sense. 300 young people, many in their first jobs, yeah. and we're raising 30 million. And we just did the same thing. We gave a sacrificial gift. And remember, it was one month's salary. And we tithed. And we moved. And God was faithful. God took it and he multiplied it. And we never ever had a fundraiser. Nobody sold cookies. Nobody washed cars. Nobody, we didn't do any of that stuff that keeps us from focusing on ministry. And I was so glad to see that the Lord could help us do that. I believe in this season. And here's what happened. As we gave, God blessed us. Like, we, like, there are people in Mavuno Church who even till today, they'll take you to their house and tell you, this house came out of the seed I sowed. Wow. That God blessed me because I blessed God's work. Wow. Like, I remember the first time we pledged uh, a million shillings with my wife. We're a young couple. Broke. We're like, by God's grace, we're going to give a million shillings. Uh, God put that number in our heart. And I still remember the first day I came to church with a check of a million shillings. Wow. You guy, there's nothing like that. You're a donor. That day, you, that day you wear a suit, you know, because you're, you're in the donor community, you're in the donor community, you know, you come, you come and sit in church when the offering comes, you take the basket and you, you wait because of my, my, my ethnic persuasion, my hand was trembling a bit. Uh, that's a lot of money to give, eh? but I was like, Jesus, I'm sure it is your money. And I put it in and there was just such a feeling of praise Jesus. Look at me and my family. We're building the church. And that was, like I said, that was not the, that's not the biggest amount. That was just the beginning. It was training wheels. By the way, if we had not given that million, we'd never have given the five. We'd never have given the ten. This is what God does. And guess what? When God allowed us to start thinking we could actually have a million, even our thinking changed. Our own financial life and our planning changed. Because we're like, if we, can, if we can trust you for this for your church, why can't we trust you for this for other things? And now you can imagine for us where we are now. By the time you're giving 10M, you can trust God for big things. Yeah. Our plans right now are not in the 10M range. Let me just put it that way. Wow. Is that okay to maybe yes. not confuse somebody? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I think what I'm saying in this season is, I believe that in this season, God wants us to free the future. Now, here's what we decided to do as we prayed about it as a team. We just thought, for some of you, you may, not want, you may, you may be in a place where just because of financial commitments you've made uh, for January... Uh, February, you're able to say, okay, I want to give it, but I want to break it. And so what I'm going to do is give a certain amount each month uh, and trust God that I'll be able to give that over and above my ties to be able to free this. But there's some of you who, tr who just bite the bullet and just say, we're going to trust God for January and ask him to pro provide for us. We've done that many times. And let's see that the Lord provides. So we want to challenge every single one of you to consider being part of Free the Future. Now, this has never been shared anywhere in Amavuno Church before. You are the first ones to hear about this. We're going to be sharing it with our congregations later in the year. I mean, towards the end of the year and early in January. But we wanted the leaders to understand this and already to begin the journey of doing this. So I'm going to invite our, our, our ushers because we have cards that we want to give every single one of you. And some of you, by the way, already, you don't have to go home and pray about this. Your spouse is here. <laughs> just tell them we know what we have to do. So just look at the card. So hand the card over. Just, do you have a copy of the card on the, on the PowerPoint? It's up, huh? Well, the, not the back, huh? 
not the other side. So basically, it's going to ask you for some information. It's going to ask you for your full names. Um, and then it's going to ask you for your email and your phone number. And part of the reason we're doing this is because we want to actually, let me just say this, the information will be confidential. There'll only be, I think, maybe three people who will manage the information, and they'll be in our operations office. Uh, so it's not information that we will make public. We're going to be very careful about data protection with this. But what it does, it allows us, what we want to do is be able to send you a notification every time you use one of the envelopes that's a uh, free the future envelope that tells you what you've given and what your balance is. And what the balance is. So you'll be able to be getting notifications. It'll give you a celebration when you finish and tell you you're done. Uh, so it's just a way of helping you keep track as well. Uh, so that's, that's something we want to be able to do. But also, it'll help us keep track uh, that, and to be able to know that we've done this. Uh, we want to also maybe do an, uh, uh, maybe an automated response when you, uh, j that just helps you, gives you a, give you a thank you every time you do that. So it's just something we want to be able to do that will help us with, with tracking that. So it has your phone number and your email for that. It has your Mavuno campus. Uh, if you're not part of Mavuno and you're taking part of this, then you just write, uh, you, you don't have to fill that, or you can write guest. And then number of installments. Um, we've, we've put a provision till September because we've said September is when we're trusting God to get this out. But for us, we're trusting God as early as possible. Take a step of faith and we'll trust God as early as possible. And then the amount per installment. So if your installment is, we're going to give, every installment will be 10,000 and we're doing 10 installments and you can write that. And then tick the months for that. Now, it doesn't matter if you're a student and you want to just take this step of faith. The amount doesn't matter. It's not about the amount. It's about that each person, for, but let me just say, a month's income is sacrificial for everybody. Whether you earn 20,000 or you earn 200,000 or you earn 2 million, a month's income is it's, it's a sacrifice for everyone. But here's what we're saying, people. This is how we start to put our faith in action. I believe that 2022 is not a year of talking, it's a year of faith. We're actually going to trust God to do some incredible things among us that we've never experienced. Now, the reason you're getting two cards is because you'll be feeling one, and then you will be returning, you feel both, and then you return one and keep one for yourself. And that will be like your record. So if you've only taken one, you need to get two. So ushers, make sure you're giving two to people. And so if you need your second one, please make sure that you get it, because you need one for yourself that will act as your bookmark, as your reminder, as just something you can keep somewhere safe, so that you also have a record. And you're also keeping your own track uh, of this. So. Please make sure you get a card. If you haven't got one, please raise your hand and make sure the ushers give you one. And for those of you who are already in a space where you're ready to fill that out, I'm going to encourage you to actually fill it and leave it today. Any of you who say, I want to return it to my campus tomorrow, that's fine. I'd encourage you not to go beyond that because there's a way that the cards will get lost and things will come up. So I always find the best way to obey is just do it immediately. And here's the thing also that happens is what we want to do is we're going to consolidate the amount from this group and then we're going to announce it to the church. Uh, and for those of you who are in other countries, we will send you a card as well. So not to worry, it's coming to you as well because we want to participate as a movement in this. And what we're saying is we're going to announce to the church and say our leaders have committed to give this much to free the future. And then challenge the rest of the congregation. Would you now follow the example of your leaders? and do likewise. Ah, I'm excited, guys. I'm really excited. God is going to do some powerful things. But I love the way the Lord works. He, asks, he tests us, isn't it? He says, all right, let's do this. Take the step of faith. Step out of the boat. And then let me show you something that you've never experienced. That's what you do. You step out of the boat. And then he shows you that faith works. And I believe this is our stepping out of the boat moment. I'm going to invite... Um, the people helping me with communion uh, to come up. Because we want to go into communion as we conclude. Now, Holy Communion, as you know, was instituted by Jesus himself. It didn't exist before Jesus. It's not in the Old Testament. And the reason it's not is because it's a sign of the new covenant. Now, covenant is a very powerful word because a covenant is a promise. 
A covenant is a promise. Any married people in the house? Let me just see show of hands. Married people in the house? Amen. Bless God for you. When you got married, on the day you made your vows to your spouse, you entered a covenant. I like to tell people that a covenant is not a contract. That's not a contract. A contract is something that with the right kind of conditions can be annulled, can be cancelled. There are lawyers in the house. Mercy is here. She'll tell you, contracts can be cancelled. There are conditions always put in for the terms of, of the contract. But a covenant, it's a permanent thing. And the thing about a covenant is that it is a commitment for life. It's a commitment where Jesus says to his disciples, I am committing to you as you commit to me. Now, here's the thing that God showed us with the exec team as we walked this journey. He told us, I want you to become covenant partners. I don't want you to be fellow employees in an organization. I want you to commit to each other as a family. And when you commit to that family, what you're saying is, I want to walk with you for a long time. I want to be your brother and sister. I want to look after you. I want to be a partner with you in what God is doing. Now, many of us, maybe you grew up in a mainstream church where you did communion, and I did as well. And maybe you did it because it's a thing that we're supposed to do as Christians. But I believe that a covenant goes much deeper. Because Jesus is saying, remember the covenant you have with me. That I'm yours and you're mine. But I also believe that communion, if you read Paul, you're going to realize in 1 Corinthians, communion is not just about us and God, it's about us with each other. It is our commitment to each other as a family. And it is our way of saying, we are part of this family. We are covenant members of this family. Whenever you take communion, by the way, don't take it lightly. Because yes, I'm a part of the family of Christ globally, but I'm also in a very special way when I'm taking it to my home church saying, this is my home. I'm planted here. I'm covenanting to be a part of this home. And so as we conclude, I thought it would be a very special thing for us to take communion together. And our pastors are serving us. These are God's servants. These are people who love this church, who lead. But they are first fruits. Because every single one of you, God is calling us to arise and be pastors. Amen. Every single one. I didn't hear any amen. amen. Every one of us. Remember, we said our children will be warriors. So if, you're, the, the child, if your child is a warrior, what are you? You're a bigger warrior, isn't it? So you can, we, our excuses are over. God is going to use us to bring our families to Christ next year. We've learned that. And so here's the thing. As they're serving us, and as we're taking this communion, we're connecting with Jesus and saying, first of all, Jesus, it's all about you. This is about you. But secondly, we're saying, I am planted in this house. I am planted in this house. So I'm going to ask us as we pray, I'm going to ask us to pray. Then we'll all come up and just take a cup and take one of those wafers. And then I'm thinking, was the plan that we go back with them to the seats? Or we, okay, then you go back to the seat with them, hold on until everyone has it, and then we'll take it together as our covenant meal. Amen. Amen. Father, I just want to thank you and I bless you. I thank you because we are a family. Lord, nobody gets to choose their family. We choose our friends, but it's you who places us in family. And I thank you that every one of us, some of us walked into Mavuno Church with no inkling where we were going. Some of us walked in because somebody invited us or because we saw a poster somewhere. But Lord, we found ourselves in family. You planted us in a family. And Lord, today we've learned about the power of family. That Lord, we must be planted. That we must resist the things that weaken the family. We must resist independent spirits and spirits of, of criticism and strife. We must fight those things. And Lord, today as we come to share this communion, we do it as people planted in this house. Yes. And we're saying, Lord, let the blessings of this house flow upon us. Let the inheritance of this house be our inheritance. Let the godliness of this house be our godliness. Let the success of this house be our success. Lord, let everything you have for this house next year be for me and my family. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This is what we are saying, Lord. And so, Father, as we take it, we remember you as you've commanded us. And we also remember the family of Jesus, the family that you've planted us in. Yes. And Lord, I just pray for every one of us that even now as we speak, that you'd just be doing a spiritual work. As we take this communion, 
do a spiritual work in us. Yes. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me invite us up. Just come up, come up, come up. Approach any of the pastors. Take the communion. Narrow as the road may seem I'll follow where your spirit leads Broken as my life may be I will give you every piece I hear you call I am a share this wow you know back in the day they shared a real meal and then this was actually a chapati that was just cut but we do this because we're so many of us we can't eat a chapati together amen <laughs> but we want to eat this together as a symbolic meal and it families break bread together families share meals together may this symbolize the bread that will be broken in our homes may our homes be places where God's kingdom advances May many meals, may God provide for many meals in your house as God's people come to be refreshed where you stay. May your house become a place of covenant, a place where God dwells, a place where God does his things. Oh my goodness, this is going to be such a fun year for you. Oh wow. Bless you Lord. Lord, it's fun doing life as a family. It's fun doing ministry as a family. There's no better place to be. And Lord, I pray for every single person here. I pray for a spirit of adoption. I pray that Lord Jesus, they would know they belong. 
not something they know in their mind they would feel it in their spirit this is your home and even as we covenant to be each other's keeper to be each other's brother and sister i pray that this meal would symbolize that in the spirit and that lord you also will walk with us this year and now we share this meal together let's share the bread together the body of christ that was broken for us let's share the cup together the blood of christ that was shed for us if not for jesus we would not be here because of jesus we are one another's brothers and sisters there is no jew or gentile there is no tribe greater than the tribe of the lion of judah that we all belong to we are bonded we are one and this year we're going to see some of the fruits of the unity of the spirit this year that is coming and so as we conclude i want to just bless you has this been an amazing time come on let's give glory to god wow 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 you know i feel i feel like for some of you your 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 listening muscles have been built it's like you've done a whole day of teaching my goodness can you imagine next year we'll be saying okay go and sleep because tomorrow morning we'll be here at 6 <laughs> but guys the the spirit is about to break out in this church in powerful powerful ways he is hey listen maybe right now as you go um there are concerns on your mind and i just pray that whatever concern you have on your mind that the lord would even assure you it is done in jesus name you've invested time in my house I will look after your business. Yeah, whatever is concerning your mind right now, just go home expecting to find Jesus who has gone ahead of you. Yeah, he's there. That trouble you left in the morning, just go expecting that God has worked for you. Just go in with faith. That person who you left very angry, just go in like you love them by the way, like nothing happened. Tell them sweet things when you arrive and serve them and just trust God to be doing something powerful. As you leave, For those of you who feel these, our ushers will stand at the door and they'll collect. So make sure you leave only one, the other one is yours, all right? Take that home with you as a prayer point, as something you carry with you just to pray. Um if you haven't filled it for some reason, let me ask and urge that you return them by tomorrow. For our international campuses, we'll try and send them to you this week so that by Sunday, next Sunday you will have them. And that's we just want to make sure our leaders are the first. Leaders always go first. So let me bless you God's leaders. Oh. Lord, you love to bless because fathers bless. And you've taught me over the years to bless my children, to declare that they will be the head and not the tail. That Lord they will be 10 times wiser than those around them. Because these are scriptural blessings. To declare that they are blessed going in and coming out. They are blessed in the city, they are blessed in the country. And Lord, I speak these blessings with joy. I release every spiritual blessing that you've given me I release it upon your people. Every blessing you have for this church, I release it upon your people in Jesus name. I pray that Lord Jesus, you would just fill them with an overwhelming sense of joy for having spent the day in your presence. I pray that Father God, there will be no obstacles ahead of them that they cannot overcome with you. I pray that Lord their faith would take a new tangent. Even this coming month, I pray that Lord you'd give them such a passion for prayer. such a desire to spend time with you something they've not experienced before and lord i'm praying that you would give them stature like jesus jesus had stature i speak stature over you god's people stature means that your bodies will be strong that you will be healthy in every way may god give you wisdom wisdom was a quality of jesus may you be able to understand mysteries and to be able to speak to people and give them the solutions that they need May God give you favor with God. Yes. That was something Jesus had as well. May you find that you just are that child that Jesus loves. Oh come on somebody. I'm praying that God would give you a sense of his love for you. That you not even be praying begging prayers. You'll be praying like a amazement prayers in front of your papa. And lastly, favor with man. That was another attribute Jesus had. I speak favor with your spouse for those of you who are married with your spouse to be those who are not married i speak favor with children your children your siblings i speak favor with your parents 
By the way, from today's talk, some of you are going to be reconciled with your parents by the end of this year. Yeah. I speak favor over you. Favor, favor, favor. Favor with God and with man. I speak favor with your employers. I speak favor with your clients. Somehow, people will just like you because that's how they were with Jesus. He had favor with man. And so, Father, I declare and call down your blessings upon your children. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and God's people say it together. Amen. Amen. Give God glory. Woo.